All right. So uh, thanks again to Christy Whittle and to Caleb Boyette for being uh, the guinea pigs today and answering our questions. Uh, I've been excited about this series for a while. I just think it just it deals with some issues that I think we're, we're all kind of wondering about and, and some questions that we're all asking and looking for some of these same answers. I came across this quote uh, as we get started today. It says, courage is when you are ready to face the questions you have been avoiding your whole life. I love that. Courage is when you're willing to face the questions you've been avoiding your whole life. And I think it's especially uh, useful today because the question of today and the person who's asking it is, we're going to find out. I think it took some courage for this person to ask this question of Jesus. Uh, but I, we chose this question to be the very first question because of its universal nature. It is a question I think so many of us ask this question. Now, we may not ask it in the same way that it is asked in the scripture, but the heart of the question, the core of the question is a, is a question that a lot of us have asked. In fact, I think, in fact, most of us, if not all of us, ask this question in some form or another. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn to a book called the book of Matthew. It is uh, the first book there in the New Testament. Uh, just to let you know where this is coming from, if you're not familiar, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are the biographies, if you will, of the life, the teachings, the activities, the ministry of Jesus. So four different authors compiled all of these stories and conversations in the life of Jesus and put them down for us to, to know and understand him even today. And we still look to these, these books uh, in order to, to understand who Jesus is. And so we're looking today in Matthew, but in fact, let me just say this, this conversation that will, Matthew will be our home base, okay? Uh, but this same conversation is recorded in three of these uh, books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all thought that this conversation was important enough to, to include it in their, in their versions of the life of Jesus, okay? So we're looking at Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible today, we, we haven't done this in a while. It's been a while since I've said this, I think, because of COVID, but there should be a Bible near you in the rack underneath the chair somewhere around you. You can pull that Bible out and use it, and we always say, if you don't have a Bible at home, you take that one with you. It's our gift to you. So Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? This is an important question that I think, as I've said before, everyone asks. He's saying, like, so how do, how do I know? How, how can I be sure that I have attained eternal life? How can I be assured that my life, when it is over, it is not over? But when you really understand who, is, who it is that is asking this question, you're going to realize that, that the question is even more interesting uh, than at first uh, it, it, it seems to be. Uh, because um, when you read the story, uh, we find out that this guy, uh, it's recorded not quite so much as clearly here, but in other versions, uh, he is often called or traditionally called the rich young ruler. So let's kind of paint a picture about this guy and who he is and, and the life that he, that he leads. Um, I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of describe him in modern terms so we can kind of understand him a little bit better. Um, I think if he had lived in our world, his name would have been Mark. Uh, uh, Mark with a C, though. Okay, Mark with a C. Uh, Mark with a C uh, looked like he stepped out of a J. Crew catalog. Mark with a C is rich. His accounts are full. His house is large. Mark uh, and his wife, Darcy, uh, they only wear the best clothes, the finest clothes. And his kids, Niles and Frazier, they only go <laughs> to the best schools. Mark is so handsome. It's sickening. And on top of that, I really believe this. Mark is so nice. It's annoying. You see, Mark with a C, he's not just very rich. He's also very religious, and he takes his religion very seriously. How do we know that? Well, because it says in Luke's gospel, a certain ruler asked him. That's why he's called the rich, young ruler. So when it says ruler, what does he rule? What does he have authority over? Most believe that he was a, a ruler or a leader in the local synagogue. So let me translate that into our world. Uh, Mark with the C isn't just rich, he's respected, but he's so respected because of his religion that even though he is on the young side, he is still chosen, invited to serve and to lead as his church's elder or one of his church's elders. 
So this is the kind of guy that other guys envy, right? He's young, he's rich, he's respected, he's a model citizen, he's a pillar of the community. So far, you look at Mark's life and, and everything seems to have gone his way. This is the last guy that you would expect really to, to, to be unhappy. This is the last guy you would think would be troubled about his life. Now, you might be stopping and wondering, okay, where do you get that, Wes? Right? We just know that he went and asked Jesus a question. Well, the fact that he's unhappy, the fact that he's unsettled and troubled about his life is actually contained in the question itself. It's what he asks Jesus. He says in verse 16, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, the just because someone wants to be assured of eternal life doesn't mean they're necessarily dissatisfied or unhappy in this life. It's true, but I don't think that's the case here. Um, the problem that we have here is that, that we often misinterpret eternal. And we look at it through a, like a very American lens. And when I say that, what I mean by this, uh, we as Americans, we generally, this is not always the case, but we generally will choose quantity over quality, Right? Uh, and, and you want proof of that? Just examine the size of the portion of food you get when you go to lunch today. Uh, restaurants understand this, right? So what do they do? Well, they give us mediocre food, but they give us great quantities of it. So we, like, we feel like we're winning because we got a lot of bad food. And so, hey, listen, we're good. So we love quantity. We think it has to be bigger, more, and, and bigger and more is always better. And so I think sometimes we read eternal life and we think we're talking in terms of years, of, of length of life, of, of the infinite eternal qualities of that life. Um, but the really, the, tr the truth is, is that he wants uh, not just, let me put it this way, he doesn't want more of the great life he already has. I don't think that's the case. Um, he wants a better kind of life. When he says eternal life, well, the word eternal life, that term is, is used 50 some odd times in scripture. Now here's what's interesting. Every time it's used, it's used to describe primarily a quality of life rather than a quantity of life. Think of it this way. Heaven is not heaven because it's an endless life. Heaven is heaven because it's the best life. That's why it's heaven. Uh, so despite all that he had, all the privilege that he enjoyed, all the blessings that he experienced, all the respect that he had been given, something in this man's life was still missing. We mark with the sea. He's done what so many people have done before him. He has climbed to the top of the mountain of, of success. Right? And uh, he enjoys a life that other people long for. He's the kind of man other people look up to. He appears to be as well-rounded and as well put together as anyone as you will ever meet. He's, he's rich, he's religious, he's righteous, he's powerful, he's moral. He was a good man, and he seems on the surface to have a good life. But Mark knows the truth, the truth that everyone who reaches his status, everyone who climbs to the top of that mountain comes to learn. And it's this, is that despite all that he has and all that he enjoys, it's still not enough. And something is still missing. Something is still lacking. See, Mark here knows from firsthand experience the disappointment that, that comes with the realization that the, the human soul is so empty that you could pour all of the world's money and power and pleasures into it, and you wouldn't even begin to satisfy it. Because he has all of those things. And what he's learned is what so many other people have learned before him, is that those things have only served as a, a distraction to him. And it seems what has happened is that these things are no longer able to distract him, which is why... He has gone looking for Jesus. See, Mark doesn't just happen upon Jesus. He, he, according to the, the text here, he doesn't just coincidentally bump into him. He has gone looking for him. He has pursued him. 
Matthew says that he came up to Jesus. Now, this implies that his action was premeditated, that it was deliberate, that he was looking for this moment, trying to create this moment. But Mar or that's Matthew's version. Mark's version says it this way, that he ran up to him and knelt before him. Here's what's interesting. Men like Mark in his world and in his culture, men like Mark don't run. In that world and in that time, if you had attained that station of life, you don't run because running was considered uncouth. It was undignified. It was unbecoming of a man who was in his station. So men like Mark, they don't run. And men like Mark certainly do not kneel. They do not kneel, especially in front of uneducated backwater preachers from no-name, one-stop-light towns. But what that shows us is this is more than just a common curiosity. Here's what's interesting to me. We think that the only time we really begin to seek the Lord, the only time we begin to turn to God, the only time we begin to investigate or even reconsider Christianity or faith or Jesus is when life falls apart. Like the only time we'll ever really give faith a second look is when we encounter real suffering. But here's what we see in his life, and I think it's true more often than not, is that every now and then, every now and then, on the rare occasion, sometimes we are able to assess our lives honestly. Every now and then, we're able to see our lives clearly. And when we do, we get a brief glimpse of the reality that the successes that we have, the pleasures that we enjoy, the security that we have built into our life, it is just an illusion. It is just a distraction. And sometimes when we get to that level of honesty and we see that kind of clarity, sometimes even our success can point us to God. It, it's rare, but it does happen. And I think some of us, you know exactly what I mean and you know exactly how he feels. You're able to empathize with his emptiness. In a lot of ways, there are some of us in this room and, and those of you who are joining us online, you, you understand what he is going through. And, and, and it's why you may be even here today. Maybe that's the catalyst for you being here, or maybe the catalyst for you, you joining online, tuning in. Maybe that it's those moments when all the distractions are quiet, just for a moment, right? Maybe a lot of times it's the, the end of the day, right? Just before you drift off to sleep and there's no, no visuals, no audible, no, nothing's in your head and nothing's in your ears, nothing's in front of your eyes, and you really can take a stock of your life. And, uh, and you realize that despite all that you have, the fact that you have nothing really to complain about, you might even feel like, you know, um, you feel bad. You feel guilty for being feeling this way. Feel guilty for feeling discontent. But you still have this lack of, of contentment. You still have this dissatisfaction that's, that, that's associated to your life despite all that you have. And you realize that something's still missing. Something is, is still lacking, that all that you have and all that we enjoy, it's still not enough. You begin to see that the life you've pursued, the life you've, you've put together for yourself, isn't really the, the life you, you really wanted. And like our friend, Mark with the C, what happens is you make a move. You make a move towards Jesus. You make a move towards faith. You reconsider Christianity once again. You, you, you've sought him out. You've come looking for him because you have a question. And the heart of the question is this. What do I need to do in order to experience the life I really want to have? And that's what he asks him there. Remember, because what he's searching for is not a quantity of life. He is searching for a quality of life that has eluded him so far, that's eluded a lot of us. So he goes to Jesus asking this question, and Jesus says to him, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So he points him back to the commandments. So what are the commandments? Well, the basis of the commandments are what we call the Ten Commandments. But out of that, what, what we did was we, we, we teased out over 600 different commands and laws. And so Jesus points back to the commandments. He said, keep the commandments. And then Mark's response is interesting. It's, it's, it's curious. He says, well, which ones? 
And that kind of implies the fact that he's assuming that some of them are optional. Some of them are, are unnecessary. And, and this really comes from the fact that, he, that you're, what you're seeing here is, the, um, is really kind of the clues of, a, of an ongoing debate that was, was happening at the time of Jesus. Because everybody knew, like, if, if your path to salvation, if your path to life was through your obedience to the law, and you had 600 laws, everybody understood it was, it was impossible to keep all of those laws. So what did they do? Well, they said, well, there are some laws that are heavy and some laws that are light. That's how they called them. They, they put them in these categories, right? And the heavy laws were the ones you, you could not fudge on, right? Those, you had to get those right all the time. The light laws, eh, there's a little bit of give and take in some of those. Some great areas in those light laws. Uh, so these laws you have to hit, get all the time. These laws are, eh, you, you can, you know, get around some of these, right? The problem was, and, and you can understand, when you're in, your salvation was based on keeping the law, no one agreed which ones were right or wrong, right? Which ones were heavy or light, because uh, there's a lot riding on getting that right. So that was a debate that was ongoing. And so when he says which ones, they, we, what we're seeing here is he's right in the middle of that debate. Which laws are heavy laws? Which laws are the necessary, essential laws? Which ones do I have to keep if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to attain the life that I want? And so Jesus replies, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then, you know what Mark says? Mark says, all these I have kept. And you're thinking, wow, this guy truly is amazing. Either that or he's incredibly arrogant. Because what it looks like he's saying is that he's just claimed to have moral perfection. Right? He's done what none of us have been able to do. He's claiming a moral perfection but here's the truth. He lives in a world in which he has been taught, been raised in the idea that he actually could do this, that the law was attainable, that keeping the law was possible. In fact, there was a, another book that was kind of a supplement to the Jewish scriptures. That was a book of wisdom and ethics, and a lot of Jews read that book, and they followed that book. And that book said this, if you choose, you can keep the commandments. And to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. Right? So if you choose to, you can do it. Right? If you choose to, you can attain salvation through the, the keeping of the law. And, and let me add this. So there was a guy named Paul. Paul was a, a major player in the early church. Right? He was, he was one time Jewish. Not only was he Jewish, but he was a super Jew. Right? He was a Pharisee. He was uh, so super committed. Like his life was, was based on the, the strict obedience to the law. And now he's reflecting on that life before. And you know how he describes himself? He says, as to the law, I was blameless. Now, did Paul really mean that he had, outside of Jesus, attained a level of moral perfection? No. Paul was highlighting the problem with the law, is that what the law does and what the law was doing to Mark and what the law did to him was the law affected the outside. The law only influenced the behaviors, the externals. And so what it was is, is that you have uh, these people who were taking this divine perfect law and they were applying a flawed human standard to that law. And they said, as long as you don't do the thing, right, as long as you don't physically act in that way, then you've committed no sin, you've done nothing wrong. And then what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus came in and blew the top off of that and said, listen, you, you've, you've been said, you know, don't, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you, you look lustfully at a woman, and what does he do? He internalizes it. And, and suddenly the requirement gets much greater. It's not about what you do with your hands or your feet or your body. It's not about your behaviors. It's about what is going on in your heart, where that sin actually comes from. But what they had done is they said, well, as long as I don't act on this externally, as long as, as long as I don't do this behaviorally, then I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't sinned. And so that's why he says, I have kept all these. Because in his world, in a, in a lowered human standard, he has actually done that. He's not lying. He's being very sincere when he says that. And so he says, I, I've done that. All these I have kept. And when he says this, you can almost hear the despair in his voice. Jesus says, he's like, how do I have eternal life? How do I have qu a quality of life that I've always wanted? And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And, and that's not what he's looking for. That's not, that's not what he wants. 
He's looking for a new way. He's looking for a, a novel approach. And Jesus points him back to the commandments. And he says, man, I, I've done that, man. I have kept those commandments. I have been righteous and religious. I have been moral. I have been devoted. And I'm still no better off. Something is still lacking. Something is still missing. So what do I do? What do I still lack? I love how he says, what do I still lack? I think Mark's approach here, what he's coming to Jesus and what he's asking for is what a lot of people still do. What's funny is we're separated about a couple thousand years between this conversation and our own lives, but the question he is asking and the solutions he's looking for are still spot on today. Because this is what people still ask, and this is what people still do. When he says, what do I still lack, what is he looking for? He's looking for Jesus to supplement what he's already done. He doesn't say, what am I missing, as if something's not there. He's saying, what am I lacking, as if something's there, but just needs a little more. You know, speaking of supplements, the, the, the supplemental industry right now, $52 billion for vitamins and supplements. So what are those there for? Well, they're there for because we, we've told ourselves, we're convinced that my diet, our diets, do not provide us with all the nutrients we need, so we have to supplement what's already there with something a little extra. I say that because that's how we approach Christianity. It's how a lot of people approach Christianity. Like, I'm okay, I'm, I'm all right, like, things are generally good, but you know what, they could be a little better, and what I need is I need a little bit of Jesus. Like, I need to supplement what, what my, my version of morality, and my version of religion, and my version of righteousness, I need a little bit of Jesus to come in and supplement my life. And that's what he's, he's essentially asking for. And, and why does he want that? Well, because I think what he really expects is he comes asking this question, and he really expects to keep the life that he had and just add a little bit of something that Jesus prescribes to it to get and make it even better. And what he doesn't realize is that what Jesus seeks to do in our lives, and, and, and I know this is going to be a little scary, so let me unpack it for a little bit. What Jesus seeks to do is not just to add a little bit of himself to you, not just to supplement your life. He actually comes in and he, he uh, demolishes it, right? He, he, he takes it apart and he rebuilds it. And I know that's frightening, but let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. So he says, what, what is it that I, I need to do? What do I still lack? And that's another problem with this. The misconception is that following Jesus being a Christian is something that you do. That's, that's really the heart of his question. What do I need to do? But Christianity at its heart is, is not what you do. It's what's it's already been done. And he thinks what the answer to that is, like for so many people, to do Christianity it means that you need to bend your will. You need to bend your will around a set of religious rules, right? You need to modify your behavior to submit to a set of, of sacred statutes. And, and honestly, Jesus' response, Jesus' answer, actually seems to reinforce that idea. He says, what do I still lack? And so Jesus goes to the next level, verse 21. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Now, this is, this is a passage that makes a lot of people very nervous. Because you think, okay, if, if it really means if I'm really going to follow Jesus, what that means is, is that I have to sell all that I have. I have to buy my way into faith by selling all that I have. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Right? I want to kind of dispel some of that. Uh, let's talk about that. Let's start here, though. In Mark's version of this conversation, Mark records this. He says, Jesus looked at him. He says, uh, what do I need? What do I lack to have this eternal life? And Mark stops, and it says he looks at him. Now, this is important. He doesn't just see him. When it says he looks at him, it means he sees into him. Jesus in this moment does what none of us really can do, is that he gets right to the heart of the issue, right? He is able to do what even our best technology can't still do 
with, with pinpoint accuracy is that he is able to get right to where the, the, the cancer lies. He gets right to where the disease is. He, he correctly and instantly identifies what's going on in this man's heart. When he says he sees him and he looks at him, he knows him. He knows him to the bottom. He probably knows Mark with the C better than Mark with the C knows himself at this moment. And so he looks at him and he knows him. And then in looking at him and knowing his heart, knowing where his issues really lie, that's when he comes up with, he says, if you want to be perfect, sell your possessions. Now, here's the thing we have to understand. This is the only time in scripture where Jesus makes this kind of demand. And he makes this particular demand because he is dealing with this particular person. He is working with Mark with the C. What does that mean? That means this is not a prescription for everyone to follow. But there are principles in it for us all to learn from. So Jesus looks at him and knows him. And what does he see? He looks at Mark and he sees that Mark's money is, is probably a little more important to him than he's letting on. That, that his money is probably more important to him than he's even willing to admit to himself. And he gets right to the heart of the issue. So he looks at him and he knows him. And he says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? And he says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Uh, you shall not steal and, and, and give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And Jesus in, it just intentionally lists all the relational commandments. And he sums them all up by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Mark then says, I've done all this. I've kept all these. And he's essentially saying, I have loved my neighbor. And Jesus says, really? That's when it gets to it. He goes, really? I want to show you how little you've loved your neighbor. You think you've loved your neighbor, but I know the truth. I know it's in your heart. And he says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions. And we're so shocked over the command to sell his possessions that we don't give much thought to the second part of it. And he says, and give it to the poor. And, and Jesus is essentially calling him on his bluff, right? He's basically saying, you claim to love your neighbor. Let's see how true that actually is. And here's the thing, okay? I want to dispel one thing, right? We look at Jesus looks into his heart and he sees him and he sees the, the, the greed in his heart. He sees the selfishness of his heart. He sees the idolatry of money that lives in his heart. And we think, oh man, Jesus is going after him, right? And he's punishing him. He's punishing him because his money is too important to him. But he's not. This isn't punishment. Let me tell you how I know it's not punishment. It says, Jesus looked at him, and then the second part of that, he says he looked at him, and he loved him. Let that sink in just for a moment. Because I believe what he does here for Mark with the C is what Jesus does for every single one of us, and it, it should absolutely floor us all, is that Jesus can look into you. He does. He knows you. He knows you in a way that, in, in some ways, you don't even know yourself. He's, he knows those things that you've tried to hide and cover up through your own morality, through your own righteousness, through your own religion, just through bold-faced lying, right? He knows who you really are. And we, I think we assume that Jesus, if he, if he looks at me, he really, really knows me. That's why we try to cover up. That's why we try to hide. We've, all, we've been trying to hide from day one. And we try to hide because we're afraid. If I'm really known, if I'm truly seen, then I can't be loved. So we have a hard time being real, being honest with ourselves or anyone else. But Jesus looks into you, knows you, knows the deepest, darkest, most deplorable things in your heart. 
and he still loves you like he loves him. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And you know what that means? That what he asks of him next is not punishment. That what he's actually asking him to do, what he's actually providing to him, he's providing him a path to find the life that he actually wants. Because he loves him, he wants him to have that life. He wants him to experience that, right? He knows he's not getting the life he really wants. And Jesus wants that worse than you want it for yourself. You know that? He wants you to experience that life even more than you want it for yourself. We say around here, Jesus makes life better, makes us better at life. That he wants that for all of us. But see, but his way there is not always the way we would choose. And what he says is, he says, I'm going to give you a path. I want you to find, discover, experience the life that you really do want. And how do you do that, Mark? You're going to give your stuff away. Because it's an anchor to your soul. It is actually holding you back. See, Jesus understands what what we're coming to find out about ourselves. I I read this study, and I thought this was so important. A study that revealed that whenever you do something for yourself, right, whenever you treat yourself or pamper yourself or you buy something for yourself, right, you get a little shot of pleasure. Feels good. There's nothing wrong with that. I get that. I've done that. We've all experienced that. We do something for ourselves. It feels good. We experience the pleasure that comes from that. Here's what's interesting is that when you repeat that again, your pleasure actually is diminished. And every time you repeat that action, your satisfaction decreases with every repetition. That when you live solely for yourself, and when it's really all about you, and you're serving and satisfying and pleasing yourself in whatever way that comes to you, that the the returns are always diminishing. But... When you repeatedly do something for someone else, there are no diminishing returns. And what that means is, when he says, listen, if you, if you can learn to give yourself away, hold loosely to the things you have and turn it over for someone else's benefit or for someone else's good, then the light that you have, the, the, that, the satisfaction you long for, the quality that you're looking for that brought you here, kneeling at my feet, asking for, that can be yours. It's yours. If you'll just let go of it. And he can put him on a path to the life that he always wants. What he looks for. But see, sometimes I I think what happens here is what Jesus does more than once, you find him doing this all the time, is that he is really trying to help us understand. He's trying to help Mark understand. He's trying to help us understand that you are typically not going to find the life you're looking for in the places where you've always looked. You're not going to discover it in the sources that you always go to. And so what he has to do is he has to do something to disrupt our patterns, to disrupt our cycles. And so what he does often is, is he, he says something that is so incredible, something so over the top. It is meant to be shocking. It is meant to be jarring. It is meant to be disruptive to our patterns and our cycles and the things we go to over and over again, trying to find the solutions we've always been looking for in the same places. And he has to get us, jar us out of those established patterns of behavior. And that's what he does here. He says, sell everything, Mark, liquidate all of it and go give it away and then come and follow me. And it's supposed to be jarring to him, like opening his eyes, And making him come to the realization, looking in the mirror and coming to the realization, maybe, maybe I'm not loving my neighbor like I thought I was. Maybe I'm I'm really not truly keeping the commandments. Maybe despite how how it appears, I'm not all that righteous. Maybe I'm not as as good of a man as I as I thought I was. Listen, he doesn't. He doesn't take Mark and and take him to the law and show him, hey, you have to use the law in order to be saved. He takes him to the law and the demands of the law 
to show him how he needs to be saved. And, and that's what he's trying to get him to understand, to understand how far he was from where he really needed to be. And the problem is the answer that he gets from Jesus when he goes asking his question was more costly than he was expecting. And look what it says at the end, verse 22. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And the word there, sad, is the word for grieved. It's more than just being sad. It means he's experienced a loss and there's a sense of finality to this. Why? Well, he wanted a better life, but he didn't really want to abandon his life. We know that, really. I mean, honestly, as, as sad as the ending is, we knew it was coming. We, we got a glimpse of it, and, and even how he formed the question in the first place. It was a little bit of a foreshadowing, I believe. Because what did he say when he, when he initially approached Jesus? What did he ask? He says, what do I need to do? Now think about that for a moment. What do I need to do? That's very, very different than going to Jesus and saying, tell me what I need to do. See, when you walk up to somebody and you say, what do I need to do? You are still in control. And what you're saying is, Show me what your solution is to my problem, and I'll judge whether or not I think it's viable. I'll judge whether or not I want to try it. But when you go to, to somebody and you say, tell me what I need to do, well, the decision's already been made. And you've come to the realization, I, I can't solve this, I can't fix this, I can't change this. I need to be told what to do because I am out of my depth right now. A couple of years ago, uh, I had a little spot of, of skin cancer on my shoulder, had it removed. My approach to that moment was to go to the doctor and say, tell me what I, I need to do. I wasn't putting myself in a position of authority, right? I, I, I realized I am out of my depth here. I don't know what this is. I don't know what it can do. I don't know how to treat it, right? I'm not even going to pretend to know. I recognize your authority in this situation. So I'm not going to approach you and go, hey, so what do I need to do? And I'm not going to judge whether or not I should do that or not. I'm going to recognize I don't have the answer to this problem. So you just tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. See, that's what he didn't do. He still wanted to be in control. And even asking the question, he wanted to know, can I have, I wanted to evaluate this. I want to know if I'm willing to to pay that cost. I'll make that determination because he still thought he could get it another way. What's the question? The question is what we all ask. What do I need to do to get the life that I really want? What's Jesus asking you to do? He dealt with Mark with a C in this way. How's he speaking to you right now? Because he is looking into you like he looked into him. And he is loving you like he loved him. And he wants for you to have the life that you want to have, the life you were made to have. But what's the answer that God is giving to you? What's your next step? We understand what it was for him. What's God saying to you? See, for some of us in this room, we, we came with faith, and we need to take a next step in our growth, our development. And, and that next step for a lot of us in this room is just to stay on guard because these things, like our money, like our things, like our security, like our identity, I mean, these things creep back into our hearts and, and they displace God from where he needs to be and they become more important than they should be in our lives. And we have to stay on guard against those things and we have to constantly shine a light on those things in our heart and confess those things and, and repent of those things and walk away from those things. And it's a constant struggle for you, for me, for all of us. And that is the next step is for you just to be open and honest with God and say, what is it that's taken your place? What is it that I'm looking to, to do for me what only you could do? What, am I, what is it that's in my life that I'm asking to be God in my life? And then letting him speak to you letting him show that to you, letting him reveal that to you. And then taking the steps, taking the steps to clear it out. But for some of us, some of us are coming, we're coming with questions. We're coming 
to reconsider who Jesus is and what, what Christianity is all about. And really, I just want to be honest with you, man, your, your next step really is, man, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Maybe that's your first step. Your first step of faith. Tell me what to do. Because I can't, I recognize, I can't fix this thing. I can't solve this thing. I can't change myself. I can't heal myself. I realize Despite all of my best efforts, I can't, I can't save myself. So God, tell me what to do. Maybe that's your first step. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. I would encourage you to take that connect card that's in the seat back pocket. Let us know how to, how to reach out to you. Let us know how to connect with you. And then I want you to take a moment and just reflect on what are those, those responses at the bottom? Those little check boxes. What are those responses? And which one of those really does resonate most with you? Which one reflects where you are in your spiritual journey right now? And I'm just going to ask you, would you please fill that out and check one of those boxes? And you could bring it to us at the Discovery Center, or you could drop it in one of the orange boxes. But what you do there is you're just giving us permission just to walk beside you for a while, just to help you unpack some of this, to help you understand some of this. Take those steps that you need to take. Give us a chance to do that. It would be a privilege and an honor to do that with you. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time, for this word, for what you are doing and saying. Thank you for this man's honest question so many years ago and how it still speaks to us today, how we still hear ourselves in his question and how we still see you in the response. So draw us close to you in this. We pray this in Jesus' name.